Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1. And they recently launched a developer platform for complete code control. Frame Rate episode 109. I'm Tom Merritt. Oh, it felt like just yesterday we were seasoned citizens of only 68 years old. And now look at us. We're 109. We're a burden on society and we can't recognize our grandchildren. I'm Brian Brushwood. I can't feel your legs. I'm Tom Merritt. Uh, hey, <laughs> so uh, bad lip reading for those on the yes. audio podcast is what that was all about at the, at the beginning. And, and football, very sports okay. ball related. So here's what you got, right? The bad lip reading. If you haven't seen the bad lip reading take on the NFL, I thought it was pretty good. And everyone was like, you know, of course, the NFL is very litigious about using any of their materials in non-permitted venues of rebroadcasts and so on. So already you've got one story where bad lip reading takes on the NFL. And so far, the NFL hasn't pulled down their awesome video of it. But now you have a remix made into a song of a bad lip reading parody and then you have us, a news organization, replaying Whoa. the song that's a parody of the NFL. An orange peanut? Orange peanuts. For you. Yeah. For you, that, Tom. For me? Did <laughs> for I show you. you that picture of an attractive female? Let's look at the <laughs> no. big story. This just in, the big story. All right, we've got Time Warner Cable. We've got Netflix. We've got a net neutrality dispute. Brian Brushwood, you can guess what the story's about, right? Uh, zombies? That's later in the show. Oh, That's sorry. The no, then no, I have no idea what, what you were, about. We were Go supposed ahead. to say is, well, obviously Time Warner is trying to block Netflix from getting at their subscribers because that's what it's always about with Netflix, of right, course. Tom? And I would say, well, no, Brian, I've tricked you again. Ha, ha, ha. What? Did you because... trick me again? <laughs> no, I didn't because you said zombies. Uh <laughs> This is a, a multi-channel news story from last uh, end of last week where Time Warner is complaining that Netflix won't give them content and that Netflix is violating net neutrality. Now, now, what does it mean for Netflix to give content of any type to someone like Time Warner? It doesn't make sense because Netflix doesn't. I mean, is this about the Netflix originals or what does it mean to give us something? It's actually about the the quality. Netflix provides super HD which is essentially just a less compressed 1080p uh, sure. version of their service, and 3D videos to customers who have an ISP who have uh, taken part in what Netflix calls Open Connect. Open Connect is a free program. You don't have to pay anything to be a member of it, where Netflix will locate some of their hardware either in your ISP's uh, data warehouse or close to it so that that data that Netflix provides won't have to rack up a bunch of transit fees for Netflix. It'll well, get right just, straight to your customers. It's actually great for your customers as an ISP. Yeah, so this isn't necessarily just a an ease of logistics thing. This is a cost-saving uh, thing for them as well, I would assume, that the bandwidth costs have to be cheaper if they're moving fewer bits over less territory, right? Right. Uh, well, it definitely saves Netflix a lot. 
uh, and not having to worry about routing through. Uh, pe- remember, there was that big thing where Comcast is like, well, if you want to reach our customers, you're going to have to pay transit fees. And Netflix got all bent out of shape about it. Uh, what this does is, is it saves Netflix a little money for sure. And it, and right. it also provides a better uh, quality service to the ISP's customers. What Time Warner is complaining about is they're saying, look, we're in negotiations. We'd like to be- take part in Open Connect. But the problem is Netflix is saying we won't give your customers 3D or Super HD versions of Netflix unless you participate. And that's a violation of net neutrality. No, wait, uh, but I don't think so because they definitely uh, they definitely incur a higher cost to deliver that. Pro- like, think about it this way. Netflix is saying we will give you the maximum quality of signal with the highest fidelity for this amount of money. This is our budget to accomplish this thing. If you want to play ball and make it to where we can get it to you cheaper, then you will get it completely cheaper. But it's not us to, uh, up, up to us to pay extra to deliver extra high quality over what to Time you. Warner co- says, what Time Warner says is, I thought the net was neutral. I thought bits were bits. I thought that if you put your stuff on the internet, everyone will be able to access it. And you're saying, I'm going to block ISPs from receiving some of my stuff uh, unless they play ball with me. And there, and there is some cost involved in maintaining the hardware and installing it, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I mean, it's it's tough. Uh, I I can almost hear where they're coming from, but it's like I'm not buying it. It's like what what this is going to do is if they really want to raise a stink out of it, it's just going to make Netflix throw up their hands and say, uh, yeah, you know what? Nobody gets 1080p super well, high no, enough, but, whatever. But C- Cable Vision already has a deal. The Google gigabit internet in Kansas City already has a deal. So there's already people out there who get the Super HD and the 3D. That's what Time Warner is complaining about. They're like, we are perfectly capable of handling that right now. If you let our subscribers access it, even without your boxes taking up space in our data warehouse and us having to pay IT okay, guys. But, but it's, not, it's, not a matter, it's not a matter of being able to do it. I mean, you know, we're able to bounce all of our television signals off the moon, but that doesn't make it the smartest way to deliver things to you it's like there there is a hard cost of infrastructure that has to be uh, factored into this no extra cost to netflix to let customers access uh that content Mm, wait if that's true you wait now okay now i see what you're saying you're saying if that is true then why would they even bother to try to get everybody on board with having their infrastructure built in there's, there's, there's cost of transit in general, but I'm just saying that if they said, well, you, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make, we're gonna make that, uh, that box available on the internet, and anybody on the internet can access it. We're not going to do anything to transit it specially. We're not going to try to manage its quality. It's just there. We've got, we've, got an, we've got a box on the internet, and if your people want to try to get to it over the internet, that's the way the internet works. No, that no, no. See, that, that, that's extra. not fair. That's not fair to Netflix because if what Netflix is trying to do is take an Apple-like uh, tack to this where they want to preserve exquisite video quality because that's what they're promising that's with Ultra what the HD. cost is about. Netflix is operating as their own content delivery network. They're saying, right. look, the, mo- the, the best quality uh, is for us to put that box really close to you. Uh, and Time Warner's like, sure, right. But you know what? We can handle that. Not a problem. You don't have to put the box in our service. And, and, and right now, I mean, think about it. Any website you go to, isn't located in your ISP. That's right. That's why we have the internet, right? So Time Warner has has a has a point here, which is, all right, you'll get a better quality service if you locate the box. We get that, but it's still the internet, and you're stopping our customers from accessing something you provide on the internet. Yeah, but then by that same logic, then all of a sudden you open it up to where it's like, well, whether you're on a mobile device, why can't I get the perfect, you know, ultra HD access on my mobile device? Because right now we have certain content that the moment you go there on a multi- mobile device, some of it for licensing reasons, other yeah, of it for not, content that's not delivery. By, that's not by ISP. That's by connection speed. It's perfectly legitimate for me to say as a content provider, oh, I'm, I see you're on a, a particular type of browser or I see you're on a particular speed of connection and I'm going to adjust this. But that's not what Netflix is doing. What Netflix is doing is saying, I see you're on Time Warner. And since Time Warner doesn't play ball with us, we're not going to let you access our service the, in, in this, these two cases. Uh, I, I don't know. It's they, just they, a matter of of – play ball. I mean, it's it's a matter of they have a specific level of service that is available if you 
uh, have a, a certain amount of infrastructure to it's allow for it. Neutral network. That that's exactly what you, the argument you're making is exactly what the Comcast and Time Warner's have been making. Of look. We just want to provide a high quality service to our users. So, you know, if if we're saying, you know, you have to pay us a little extra to get into our network and access our users, that's because we need that money to provide a higher quality service. Uh, yeah, but uh, OK, what, if that is the case, if somehow in this twisted, perverse moment of my life, I'm defending anti-net neutrality from cable companies. Uh, where is the anti-competitive angle on Netflix side of things? Convince me That's, that Netflix is a bad guy here. I don't think this is an anti-competitive angle. In fact, I think this is an example of the free market at work. Because what Netflix is doing is violating net neutrality. They're saying, we're going to pick who gets to access our service based on what their subscriber is. And that vi the principle of net neutrality is, once you're on the internet, you should be able to access pretty much anything on the internet Uh what, no matter what service you're using to access the internet, right? Uh, sure. and, and And so I think Time Warner has a real case here. But what Netflix is doing is saying, hey, Time Warner, you want to play this net neutrality game? We can play it right back at you. And that's how you preserve net neutrality ideally is you have enough competition. Now, normally we talk about competition. We talk about ISP choice, whereas I as a consumer get upset that my ISP is blocking sites and so I leave them and that's is a you know that discourages ISPs from blocking me from being able to get my favorite video sites. But in this case, it's Netflix saying, "All right, you want to be like Comcast and try to charge us to reach your customers? Well, we're going to be like Comcast, and we're going to charge. We're going to make you participate in a program for your customers to reach aspects of our service that they like." Yeah, I, I guess this is one of those moments where um, you know, especially in the early days of net neutrality coming up as a legal issue. You know, there's a, the, the arguments that even the EFF is divided on on the issue of net neutrality, where it's on the one hand, they, of course, want free and open access to as many people as possible. But the EFF, of, of course, is very suspicious of involving litigators and lobbyists and, and the, the hammer of government involved in it. And I think this is one of those counterintuitive tit for tat moments where as ugly as the process is, uh, I think you're right. I think this could be the free market making things right in ugly phases as we move forward that's the way that's the way this market the market works is that i can do whatever i want but i don't do whatever i want because there are consequences to doing some things that are bad and netflix is saying this this is one of those consequences uh you know what you, you want it to work this way then we'll have it work this way and okay and it, it, that that knife can cut two ways i'm not necessarily even defending netflix although netflix is being a lot nicer about it they're saying hey it's free Granted, there's right. some costs to incur in maintenance of the hardware, but those costs are not prohibitive in any sense. And they're not even unusual. P CDNs, big CDNs like Akamai do this sort of thing all the time. And, and the ISPs are willing to do it because it's a benefit to their users. Uh, so so I, I think Netflix has, has got a high road here. But they're also saying, hey, you want no ne net neutrality regulations? You want this, there to be no laws around any of this stuff? You want, you want to say that the FCC doesn't even have the right to enforce its guidelines? Great. Let's, let's play in that ballpark then. Here we go. Well, thank goodness. Up. This is the only story of ugly agreements making it difficult for the little guy up against uh, the big Goliath. Let's relax and enjoy another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. LA Weekly has this long, sordid story that I, I've actually been avoiding throwing into frame rate for a couple of weeks. This is our month, really. Uh, this has been dragging on with lots of different YouTube talent complaining about Machinima and Maker Studios. Uh, and this LA Weekly article compares it to the early days of Hollywood, where talent gets all starry eyed and was like, oh, a network on YouTube wants to, you know, promote my stuff. This is great. I get access to a bigger audience, more resources. And then down the road, they realize, oh, crap, this contract says I don't own any of my intellectual property, and there's no end to the contract. There's no, there's no sunset date. It's open-ended. And so we're going through this painful process where some of the talent is getting really upset, going to Twitter, going to YouTube, saying, I'm out of here. They ripped me off. The agencies are like, wait a minute, that's not never been our intention to rip you off. This is we were just taking contracts that are perfectly normal in the entertainment business, and we we're using them. Let's let's adapt. Uh, but it's an entirely different set of circumstances because, as this LA Weekly article points out, 
they don't need a union in this case. Back back in the Hollywood days, it was all about unionizing the actors, unionizing the crews. Uh, these these folks, they're skipping right over that step. They're organizing on Twitter, on the internet, and engaging sure. mass audiences directly. Well, and here's the other thing, and and you're right. In that the early days, you know, as this is the wild west of new media and we're just getting started here, there are some very, you know, some might say usurious contracts out there uh, as these young kids get their opportunity. And no, they're not reading any of them. And yes, you could easily say you guys should have read the contract, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But but they're legitimately awful contracts. Let's go ahead and grant that. OK, for for some of them. Uh, the difference is somebody Back in the 1920s, we'll say, was Humphrey Bogart in the 20s? We'll say he was. Let's say back in the 20s. Humphrey Bogart is paying for his own suits that he's wearing. He's, he's not making hardly any money, but they're making him a big star, and that's what they keep telling him. The difference is, is back in those days, he had no recourse. He had no other way outside of to go to another studio. And the other studio, of course, this being this kind of like an oligopoly, they're, uh, they're going to keep the prices in a way that benefits them. But the difference is, is nowadays, these, these youngsters who are starting off in new media on channels like Machinima are, are building an incredibly powerful brand so that when they go over to Twitter and they or when they start their next project or when they 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 break away they instantly monetize and they're able to they're able to take something that is of great value that Machinima definitely was a big part of helping them build and they're able to jump over with their name and start doing other stuff so it's it's hard for me to want to boohoo too much on either side really yes all the kids are dumb cuz they didn't read the contract um Yes, all the kids are jerks because they can easily jump ship and do a different project uh, out in a different But, they, can, but they, can't, they can't jump ship. You know, in a lot of cases, the contract actually, actually prevents them from jumping ship. It says like no. Never? You, yeah, you, it's got non, there are non-compete clauses in some of these things. Some of them say, no, you're obligated to provide a certain amount of episodes to us and you got to do it. Uh, so uh, to me, it's not so much about – the you know the benefits of the YouTube stars. Uh, oh well, they got all this build up from Machinima and Maker. That that should be balanced out. Maker and Machinima should get a lion's share of the early revenue. They should get the rights to exploit the material that is made for a limited amount of time. Uh, but but these contracts go way over that. They say we own everything you made for us in perpetuity, and you get nothing out of it. Uh, okay, no, and, but, and but that's legit. Paid. That is a hundred percent legit. That's Why that's called work for hire. That's that is that is called work for hire. I need a content creator to come work for me in the content making factory. Yeah, it's a content making factory, and that that's crap. Don't ever sign that contract uh, because <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, unless unless you want to work for hire, I mean that that's something you should go in with your eyes wide open. Is like, all right, I'm I'm got to know going into this that I am investing in work for hire and this is not mine when I'm done with it. That's that's perfectly legitimate if that's what you're saying and I and I get that. But if you're going into it as a lot of these guys were is this is me. I'm making me and I'm putting me out there on the internet and you didn't have a lawyer review these these agreements and yeah you should read them too but honestly they're so complicated you really need legal representation you need legal review of these things to say okay well if you do this here are the consequences of it if you know the consequences then yeah right okay work for hire is a perfectly legitimate option but that these 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 things didn't happen that way and so i'm not blaming the machinima and maker studios either i'm saying that maker and machinima should have taken some pains to explain this as well to avoid this kind of negative reaction in their own best interests. Not because they deserve the backlash, but because you got to expect that if you have some people who really don't know what's going on and all of a sudden they feel, realize what's going on later, they're going to get angry and it's they're going to play to the audience because that's the way the system works. It's all about social networks. It's all about playing to the audience. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't know. It's 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 tough for, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to really speak for either side, but I will say this much. Like, I don't think it's unreasonable for a machinima to own the stuff that that they paid people to create for them. You know, like if your job is like, we want you to come work at machinima or sign with us, help provide this content. You provide more of the videos that'll drive our overall traffic. We will cut you in on all the profits that we're making. I mean, that's that's not an unreasonable agreement to say, well, yes, while you worked for us, you made a thing. For us, which is what the agreement was, like work for hire. I think it's also not unreasonable if you're uh, a, crea a content creator who said, "I have created this entire notion. I've conceived it on my own. I've built it. I've even kickstarted a season of it uh, and and built an audience. And I'm bringing it to you. I'm not going to just sell it 
entirely to you. I will sell you the right to exploit it for a limited amount of time and for a large amount of profit. Uh, but I, I still may, need to maintain my rights in what I make. And I think that's important for, for a lot of folks who are making content out there is to say, hey, wait a minute. When, if you're going to pour your heart and soul into something and you're going to build it up and then somebody comes along and says, hey, you got a pretty thing going there. Let me help you out. You may not want to sell them the entire thing as work for hire because then it's theirs. It's not yours anymore. Yes. That's, well, that's and that, and, and for instance, frame rate and tech news today are not mine. They're Leo's. And right. I knew that right. guy. when I came in, I said, look, I will work for hire. I will make you a new show. I will make you a frame rate show. Uh, and, and then they're yours and you get to do whatever you want with them uh, in perpetuity. And, and I have no problem with that because I went in with that idea. Sword and Laser is not. Sword and Laser is mine and Veronica. The difference is Leo said, let me help you build a show and I want to own it. And so that's the way I approach it. Sword and Laser was Veronica and I creating a thing. And then Geek and Sundry came in and said, hey, can we take some advantage of what you're doing and boost it even bigger. And in that case, you say, all right, well, hold on. Right. Well, and, and certainly that is the way that that is what you described is a great second or third project scenario. But your first project out, I mean, that's the way it's always been is young talent doesn't know what they're doing. They just want an audience and they get this massive leg up to get their stuff on a bigger platform to reach more people. And then they take their brand and develop the second thing. I mean, that's and what you described is my same situation with Scam School. I just had an idea for Scam School and I had spent two years trying to get this little Brian Brushwood on the road series off the ground. I think the most popular episode hit maybe 3000 views on it. But I had this idea for something bigger with Scam School, and I was well aware that, uh, that you know, Revision 3 is going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, get professional video editors, professional, you know, and also loan their name to it. And so it's like it doesn't, it doesn't bother me that uh, I am so thankful for the five years I've put in to, to Scam School, even though Discovery owns it. Uh, I, I, I am now in a fundamentally different position. I have gained so much in all the little ways that you can't express in a contract for it. So it's, it's hard for me to feel... Like, even if they're being screwed, if they're really being screwed. Well, but there, there's a difference to what you just described and, and what some of these scenarios are. What if you had started Scam School and done two seasons of it on your own and started to build that audience? You would have entered into the contract differently than if it was what, you know, like, I've got an idea and I've put together a pitch and I've done some samples. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's just, it, you went into it with your eyes wide open. The, the idea that, well, that's the way it's always been is exactly what's blowing up in these networks' faces. Is they're saying, yes. well, it's the way it's always been. But we're in a different age now. You can get things off the ground and build an audience without any help. What, what right. Machinima and Maker and Twit and, and, and all of these, these platforms can do is help you grow it. And in that case, it's like, well, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't wholly throw it over. But even if, the, if it is that situation where it's like, no, we really want, we want to own everything you've made here. Well, then you should know that before you sign that dotted line. And, 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 and I'm not saying that that is entirely the network's uh, responsibility. That is the talent's responsibility. It's a learning curve for this business. And that's why I, I agree with this LA Weekly story that this is similar to the early days when there was a factory. Hollywood was a factory and they had to make a movie a week. Uh, and to be able to make that work, they needed to keep it cheap. And to be able to keep it cheap, they had to sign these actors on to make several, you know, movies. And so they, they locked them into seven-year contracts. This is, to me, this is great. This means that this platform, web video, is coming of age to where people are like, there's money to be made here. We better fight about it. Yes. No, that's a really good way to put about it. These are all symptoms of a fundamental shift that's actually an indication that things are healthy in the world of new media and online video. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think we have yet another guest. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Paid content has a, a great feature that, that just shows that web series are making money or at least have the potential to make money, uh, is that they're getting second seasons more often than they used to. And the writer of this article, uh, Liz Shannon Miller, points out that, yes, there are the guilds, right? There, you know, Felicia Day's The Guild has, is in sixth season, and anyone but me uh, has multiple seasons. But most web series, you have a first season, and then that's it, right? We're not, we're not talking about non-fictional stuff here uh, as much. 
Uh, but there's several big web series, uh, such as Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, uh, Burning Love, a production of Paramount and Ben Stiller's Red Hour, Squaresville, uh, all in, in multiple seasons and getting called back. Yeah, it's interesting. This is one of those things that uh, I think is more and more evidence that uh, the problem with new media has not been a numbers problem. It's been a perception problem. And I think it's taken us half a decade to get over the dog on a skateboard perception of this whole this whole class of entertainment. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to see that uh, that people are recognizing like, I mean, all this fighting that we're doing, the fact that there's actually money there in the pie. That's good. Yeah, exactly. All right. uh, Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. Whether you're making money on your web series or not, you need need to have a website to promote it, right? Or uh, if you you got a gallery, you know, you want to take behind the scenes pictures. You want want an easy way to do that. You want it to look right on multiple devices because we were just talking about when we were talking about the net neutrality story. Some people have little tiny devices they're looking at your website on. Sometimes people have big 32-inch screens they're looking at your website on. Squarespace resizes your images seven ways. You upload one image. They make it look right on all the different platforms. They have mobile responsive designs that make sure that your beautiful template that you picked makes sense whatever screen size appears. And Squarespace is reliable. You're not gonna. You're not. Your your website is not gonna just crumple at the slightest breath of traffic, uh, like some services you might try. So, Brian, should should they take our word for it? Should we just say trust us? Go to Squarespace. No, Tom. You know what they ought to do is they ought to sign up for a free trial because they don't ask for a credit card or nothing. You just go there to uh, uh, to to Squarespace.com, then sign up for a trial, and then when you fall in love with your site, which you will, because they're gorgeous and easy to make, and they're just better than everything else in the world put together. Then you use promo code Frame Rate One mainly just so that we get credit for being the ones that tip you off to our friends over at Squarespace. But I'm sure Squarespace has some kind of awesome deal for you. What is it, Tom? Well, I'm glad you asked, Brian. If you do decide to keep your service and say, you know what, I like this free trial. I'm ready to give them my credit card number. Use the offer code FRAMERATE1 and get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code FRAMERATE1. And they recently launched a developer platform for complete code control. Even developers are going to like this too. So check it out, squarespace.com. We thank them for their support of FRAMERATE. Let's move into the slipstream. NHL is back, in case you were wondering about (laughs) hockey. They started playing this weekend. Uh, And NHL Game Center coming to the Xbox Live. Uh, You can now get HD games, split-screen viewing, scores for $50. You can get the NHL uh, package where you get all of the out-of-market games on your Xbox. And they're kind of the last major sport to the party here. There's ESPN, there's NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA, now NHL. Xbox is really trying to solidify itself, saying, look, we have the sports. You may have to pay extra for them somehow, but we have them. Soon all of your sports will belong to us. <laughs> that was Xbox. That was my impression of them. Also, YouTube says soon all of your music videos will belong to us. Uh, there was a story broke late last week that YouTube is in uh, negotiations to buy a minority stake in Vivo. We always talk about how Vivo is the number one channel on YouTube because... Music videos are the most popular piece of content on YouTube. Now, Vivo is a joint ownership of uh, Sony and Universal, uh, along with one other investor. And so Google getting into it is just sort of throwing some money in the pot to say, you know what? We want to make sure this relationship stays nice and smooth. Uh, it looks like licensing is the only thing holding this up. They, they need to nail down the licensing agreements for having those videos on YouTube uh, and then the room, the people familiar with the matter say that this will close. Ah, those people familiar with always familiar with the matter. Those people are. You're familiar with love film, aren't you? Yeah, dude. The, the, I'm sure they hate this. Like, I guarantee you their marketing department does not want to take out full page ads that says love film, the Netflix of the UK. But that's all I ever think of it as. Sometimes that may be true. Sometimes the fact that Netflix is in the UK, love film would be like, that's right. We are the Netflix of the UK because, frankly, we're crushing Netflix in the UK. There is, so don't even think that there is a Netflix there. They might like that song. I 
don't know. Uh, Love Film is owned by Amazon, and they've uh, inked a bunch of deals. Uh, now they've, they've got some NBC Universal TV shows coming, The Office and 30 Rock. Uh, they also inked some deals with Channel 4 in the U.K. Uh, to bring shows like Peep Show and uh, Friday Night Dinner. Uh, the It Crowd... Not coming yet, but they said that's on its way. And we'll we'll have every episode of the It Crowd showing up on Love Film eventually. Now this was interesting. The UK, we we got a lot of UK viewers, and and they write in and talk about how crap uh, the services are there. There's like ah, yeah, there's even Love Film, which is the best of them. It doesn't have that much. Uh, Natasha Lomas over at TechCrunch has a great story about Auric, a UK company that went to a lot of trouble. Uh, in fact, sometimes manually collecting URLs to uh, catalog what offerings are on Love Film in the UK and what offerings are on Netflix in the UK. And basically, the upshot was if you want TV shows, Netflix has got Love Film beat hands down. They've got like sure. three times the TV shows. But if you want movies, you need Love Film, which it's called Love Film, sure, right? Uh, at, because they have a lot more movies and a lot more relevant movies. Netflix has a lot of those direct to DVD types of movies. Yeah, so take that Netflix. You hear that? You're not you're not gonna have Love Film to boss around for much longer. Unless you want TV shows. That's right. In which case, uh, uh totally cool, bro. Good to see you. Love you, Netflix. Always we're friends. We should have lunch, Netflix. You and me. Just just we never do that anymore. We don't. But uh instead, let's talk about tube tops. Just a couple of stories in the set-top box world uh, today, and, and they're modder stories. Uh, do you know about ATV Flash, Brian? Uh, oh, yeah. No, I used ATV Flash when I uh, hacked my original Apple TV, and so I think it's great that they're continuing to develop for it. Yeah, uh, ATV Flash 2.1 update lets you favorite things more specifically. Uh, you can favorite individual videos, whole seasons, and even broader search terms. So I guess specifically is exactly the wrong way to describe this. Uh, they give you more flexibility in how you can favorite things. You can't. It's not just like, oh, I want to favor that series or that episode. Uh, you can you can favorite things all kinds of ways, and that and that helps you search and discover things uh, in a, in a much cooler way. Yeah, man, awesome. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, XBMC, uh, the Xbox Media Center, is uh, available for Android. Fully functional release of XBMC for Android devices. Uh, started out uh, as the Media Center application, obviously, and now uh, is, is available uh, as, as the platform that Boxy is written uh, on. And they have step-by-step -step instructions at the website, xbmcandroid.com. If you would like to figure out how to run this on uh, some kind of Android device of your choosing. But uh, yeah, they man. have in here so it's cool pretty quiet week on the hardware side of things i guess yeah pretty quiet week on the hardware side but we got lots to talk about in film film uh pretty much every single person in the audience alerted us to this story uh the zombie land tv show that has been rumored. There have been lots of postings about it, uh, lots of rumors about the cast. The original writers of the Zombieland movie are apparently on board. It's not coming to TV. It's coming to Amazon, Brian. Yeah, now this is weird because it was one of those where it's like, is this a good news or a bad news? Is this a bad news that it didn't uh, make it to, you know, quote unquote, real TV? Or is this a case where they're going to get superior programming? Because, of course, the movie Zombieland was riddled with over-the-top blood and gore to all the way to the fact that, you know, and I'm talking even on AMC with The Walking Dead, Zombieland just had, you know, it's visceral slow motion disintegrations of, of skulls and so on. You got to think that that advertisers might have might have been a little cautious had this made it to traditional TV. And there's some part of me that if that's what you're looking for is that crazy over the top zombie gore porn that maybe you should be cheering for being able to get exactly what you want out of a new media version of Zombieland. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine Amazon's going to let them go way over the top, but it's got to be some more flexibility there, right? It's on demand. You get to decide, you know, just like HBO. It's like, well, you paid for this, so. You know, you can decide whether you watch it or not. Uh, I, I think I think it's great. I, I I don't think it's a negative at all. As long you know, it's they Amazon wants quality broadcasts, quality you know, broadcast quality TV. Uh, so this is just another of the ever widening flood 
of high quality programming. We talked about all those web series getting second seasons. Uh, this this is behind it is commissioned high quality. You know what you would get on network TV coming to to things like Amazon, and then you get all all the episodes at once, which is kind of interesting. We'll see how I like. Yeah, that. absolutely. Uh, coming to South by Southwest in March will be downloaded a documentary on Napster. Did you watch this trailer? I did not watch it. Can we take a little peek at it? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's, it's, it looks like a pretty straight ahead documentary, uh, interviews with Sean Fanning, uh, interviews, uh, with Sean Parker, those, you know, the co-founders of Napster. Uh, there's even, uh, some, some clips of Lars Ulrich, uh, from Metallica explaining his lawsuit, uh, against Parker and company. So, I don't know that it's going to be some incredibly dramatic presentation, but I, I tell you what, it, it looks like a time capsule. I mean, they're pulling a lot of stuff, a lot of screenshots from that time, from 1999. Uh, and some of the things they're saying already sound, they're like, you know, eventually you're going to have music on your cell phones and, and devices we can't even imagine. And there it was. I just felt like this was one of the great moments in human history. This is a company that is building a business. You know, they've got venture capital money. My response to my opinion type fast enough was, don't take the money. You don't have a business. They're building a business by facilitating the stealing of artist music. We saw the clicks of the numbers, and that's what they were downloading at that particular time. That was shocking. The music business is a great example of just complacency being a total death sentence. I thought that the way that people got music for the last 50 years worked. The record companies are not adjusting to technology. Major music industries, entire floors were turning their lights off. I'm bootleg proof, you dig? That's great, isn't it? Metallica was coming to our office. What we're merely doing is giving Napster the information that they thought that we couldn't get them. Napster is stealing from us, straight up, and I'm going to fight them to the death. As last fall semester wore on, hundreds quickly turned to millions, with the program spreading across college campuses like wildfire. Nearly 60 million people use the site. Dude, that is awesome. I'm so 100% all in on this. I just want to, it's a time machine back to 1999. You're 100% right. Yeah, exactly. It's really fun. Uh, also, new Game of Thrones video out. Not so much a, a trailer. It's a promo video. Lots of bites from the actors talking about the season. Uh, some, some, Glimpses of new characters and new actors. So if you're you're a big Game of Thrones fan, you're you're gonna find lots of tidbits in here that are that are fun. Uh, I'll tell you the main the main thing I got out of watching this is just seeing the actors in their makeup for everything because it's like you know sometimes they'll interview the actor out of character as the actor, other times it's clearly on set, and you can see like Tyrion's got this giant scar across his face or whatever. Like there's little tidbits like that, but but having read the book and listened to people tease about oh the big dramatic twists that are coming up like none of that you know it just bounces off my forehead it doesn't really get me excited uh sundance 2013 just wrapping up in park city utah a big film festival if you're not familiar with it one of the movies out there that i think is incredibly interesting and the la times had this story uh is about a guy named randy moore he's a, a screenwriter who lives in burbank and decided he's going to go to Disney World in Orlando and shoot a movie without Disney knowing it, without getting their permission. Uh, so the movie is called Escape. Uh, it's somewhat experimental. It's described here as a surrealist genre-defying black and white film shown yeah, for the it's, first time. Uh, it's, it's Escape from Tomorrow is the full total of it, or the full title of it. And I'll tell you what. Uh, one of the things I loved about this is I almost hope that. I, I assume it was so difficult to pull off to begin with that they didn't think to do a featurette on the making of this while they were making it. But there, I loved all the talk about the lengths they went to to not look like they were shooting a professional movie all the way to like having the director be 100 yards away watching the action and giving direction over a cell phone so it didn't start to look like a crew coming together to work on a project. No printed copies of the script. Everything was on phones so that if people were looking down, looking at the script, it's, yeah, it looked like people standing around looking at their phones. Uh, and families are always taking video at the park. You know, that's perfectly normal to have a camera pointed at a couple people. Uh, so nobody noticed. Well, so, so here's the question. Uh, if you're going to lay odds, is there any chance that we will see this? In the, in the next five years, like you and me physically will be able to watch this movie. And if so, how will, what, 
under what circumstances can you and I possibly expect to actually watch this? Because I guarantee you the one that we won't expect to see it is in an actual sanctioned, you know, wide theater theatrical release. Because I don't believe that for a second. I, you know, I think the chances are very low that we would get that. But I also would have not bet that Sundance would have ever touched this. And they, they accepted it into the film festival and screened it. Uh, and Disney has not made a peep about it yet. Now, if you're wondering, like, well, why would Disney care? It's because it's got Disney iconography in the background. Uh, yes. The fact that they went into the park and filmed it without Disney's permission might be some kind of violation of your ticket agreement. Uh, but what they can actually go after them for, and, th- and this this is one of those weirdnesses of intellectual property, is if Dumbo is in the background, if the Magic Kingdom is in the background, if Mickey Mouse is in the background, that's Disney's trademark. Uh, and if you show that trademark, then you you have to get permission. Well, and if it, plus, if it's not a fair use. And in this case, it's not a documentary, it's not news, it's not necessarily commentary. He's just making a movie. Uh, right. And so that's why in movies you don't see a lot of logos that aren't paid product placement. And a lot of times you'll see things fuzzed out. And especially- worse yet, yeah, look at this. This looks like a freaking crane shot right now. I'm so curious how they even how they even did that. But but keep in mind also that these these iconic, you know, Disney trademarked items uh, aren't there just peripherally they're they're plot points in some of the visions that uh, that this guy has because a lot of it is him kind of you know brooding in this very dark disturbing territory it's kind of a bit of a a mind screw for for people watching uh in the theater so granted will we be able to watch it oh yes it's the internet this this will be out there uh and and if if randy moore can't get a distribution deal you'll be able to find it what i think is amazing uh is he told the la times it's out there and no one can change that. Uh, if this never gets distribution, that's okay. If not a lot of people see it, that's okay. I made it and it's in the world. That's all I ever really wanted. Well, and and it, they say, uh, I guess he's fresh out of Full Sail. Full Sail, of course, being, um, you know, the, the, the art college in Orlando area that uh, a lot of people, including my brother, got their start in. Uh, Ryan Connolly from Film Riot as well. So when you come out of a place like film, uh, Full Sail, usually you're looking to make your mark, to make an impression on the, uh, on the industry. And the fact that this guy, his first project was something so bold and outrageous that I got him to Sundance, I got to imagine in many ways he feel like he already won and is ready to move on to the next project. But meanwhile, I want to see this thing. I think this would be really interesting to watch. And I'm going to resist uh, getting up on my soapbox here uh i'm just gonna put one tiny toe on the edge of my soapbox and say my my constant uh my my constant theme when talking about intellectual property law is that we need to throw out the entire conversation we're having about it and start by saying what should it achieve what is the harm we're trying to prevent and in general intellectual property law copyright law trademark law all of that is to prevent uh a, a, a disincentive for creativity. We're trying to promote science and the arts with these laws. And what he says at the end of this says, hey, I don't even care if people see my work. I, I, w- I, was, I, was, in, I was incentive. I had enough incentive to go and do this. Uh, and yeah. so I think that's, that's, that's not a conclusion to that debate, but that is an essential element is like we really devalue the creative impulse a lot of times when we say like, well, if we don't have these strong copyright laws, movies won't get made. They'll get made. I'll tell you, man, it's what's interesting is seeing the lines blur because there are certain precedents that have been set on the film side of things. And we're watching that with uh, with your friend of mine, Ernest Klein, you know, trying to write a movie script for Ready Player One, where when he wrote a book, he was able to take, you know, he was able to throw X-Wing fighters and DeLoreans from the future and an Ultraman fighting a giant Spider-Man and so on. Uh, because they're just words and ideas, and nobody has tried to shut those kinds of things down uh, in in a work of fiction. But then, obviously, to translate it to movies, he's, there's all kinds of like, well, you can't use the movie War Games in it. You got to mention this other movie because that's a Warner property or whatever. So uh, I, I wonder how long. I I don't know. It's it's a very murky territory. I I don't really know what the answer is, but I'm glad to see people pushing the envelope on all sides. Uh, meanwhile, H Plus has finally wrapped up its season finale posted. And Graham wrote in and said, I just finished watching the season finale on YouTube for H Plus, where the likes of Alcatraz, The Event, and Flash Forward failed. 
H plus succeeds. In my opinion, it has made the best showing of a series of this kind in the post lost era, perhaps due to the chosen distribution and target audience. There was no extraneous material. The story was tight and never felt like there were filler episodes created for the sole purpose of padding a season. The show was fantastic, but seeing it unfold three to four minutes at a time was not the release schedule also made it hard to keep track of the story at times. Having experienced the show this way, I can't help but feel that the bite-sized format is perhaps only suitable for the YouTube stable of self-contained videos with quick cuts and loud, fast-talking personalities. Uh, thankfully, clever use of playlists make it easier to watch the show in large chunks. It can now be experienced either at eight chapters of about 25 minutes each or in its entirety. For reference, I, he has the, the links uh, at the end of his email, but we don't, actually I don't think we have them in here. I had a lot of fun with this show and hope their experiment has been successful enough to greenlight a follow-up. Uh, and I think this is what the creators of H Plus wanted, was they wanted feedback on that three to four minute thing. They wanted people to create their own playlists, and they wanted to provide a way to experience it differently at the end of the run. So now that it's all out there, you can go and watch it as a more traditional eight episodes of 25 minutes each. You know, what's interesting is uh, that there, there are structural problems with the way we watch videos on YouTube and especially with the three minute format, because uh, if you have a story that arcs over a certain amount of time and I could really only speak to uh, Battlestar Galactica, Blood and Chrome and and H plus. But in both of these cases, by taking a we'll we'll call it an hour to five hour narrative and breaking it into three minute chunks. It's as though you sit down to watch a movie and every three minutes, somebody pauses the movie and looks you in the eye and says, do you, you want to keep going? And then goes three more minutes and then stops. You're like, are you, are you enjoying it enough? And the problem is, is what that causes you to do is number one, it takes you out of it every single time. And granted H H plus tried to write with cliffhangers that get you excited about the next twist and so on. But it puts you in this position structurally where all you need is three boring episodes in a row and you'll feel like uh, like it's just not worth it to keep going or or three things off topic or I, I, you know it's 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 a very difficult way to tell this kind of story and I'm glad that now this is finished I look forward to seeing recuts to where I don't have to touch anything and it just goes straight through to a, a long form narrative without pausing all the time to ask me if I want to continue uh, also, Netflix has revved up the marketing for Arrested Development in a cool way with Easter eggs on Netflix.com. So if you go and search for the word blue, you'll get the results for the word blue in Netflix search. But you'll also get a blue handprint on the right side of your screen. And if you click on that, it takes you to a part of an Arrested Development episode uh, from the original run with the blue handprints that uh, uh, Michael Bluth is following. There's well, also I'll tell you what Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, was, there's also a couple other uh, movies you can search for, like um, Families with Low Self-Esteem, right. uh, which which is, is a movie, a DVD referred to in one of the episodes. And if you search for it, it'll come up as if it's an actual movie you could watch. And when you click on it, it takes you to the, again, the part of the Arrested Development ep episode that refers to that imaginary movie. Yeah, like just about every piece of fictional media, like I haven't searched for it yet, but I'm sure the motivational series that uh, George Bluth Sr. came up with uh, in, in prison, I'm sure that's got to be on there. They have uh, Les, Les Cousins Dangereux, uh, the Dangerous Cousins. Uh, dude, it's this is brilliant, and they're playing this exactly right. And uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, Justin Robert Young and I have gone back and forth for hours at this point, literal hours, over whether or not Netflix is doing the right thing for their promotions by releasing all of these uh, new episodes of Arrested Development all at once versus spreading it out. Justin's opinion was that you spread it out, you get people talking about it for a longer period of time. But my my side now is that what they're doing is perfect. They're getting everybody at a fever pitch, and I guarantee you they're, they're releasing it on a Saturday. Whoever releases something on a Saturday up until this point for a network, by releasing on a Saturday, they're guaranteeing everybody can binge and what's normally a lower traffic time for Netflix or for, for the internet, I think that we're going to see stories the Monday after Arrested Development uh, airs where Netflix is going to tout that on this day, 12% of all the internet traffic in, on the United States was Netflix. You're going to have some kind of ridiculous big number that, uh, that everybody's watching. And I think they're doing a really great job. And finally, Quartz, uh, finally for film film anyway, uh, Quartz has some uh, sections 
from the script of the upcoming reality show Silicon Valley, which is coming to HBO, written by Mike Judge of Beavis and Butthead fame and from Austin, Texas, I might add. Uh, and he, as is Brian Brushwood. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you get a chance to, uh, to to look at some of these excerpts? I mean, they, they're definitely going to be poking fun at, at Silicon Valley. The idea is that this is a fictional uh, show about people coming to Silicon Valley to make their way as entrepreneurs, a la Entourage, uh, was for Hollywood on HBO. Well, I think that uh, it depends on how much is there to say about Silicon Valley right now. The more that you have to say about it, the better a fictionalized format will be than reality television because reality television is so stilted and forced and you take all the pieces after the fact and you try to make up a narrative that works with all these. It's very Ed Wood-like, you know, whereas, uh, you know, something from the beginning, if you want to satirize something, you can often get to the truth of the matter. And I think there is a lot to say about Silicon Valley right now. And so I'm excited and I'm excited to see anything Mike Judge. It's going to be amazing. Just, yeah, just the description of the opening where they they show like, the cookie cutter campuses and the the really you know devoid of vegetation hills uh, around Palo Alto, but done in that style that's supposed to be like fun and dramatic, like you're showing some someplace amazing. I, they're obviously going to be it's going to be a send up. Uh, they're going to exaggerate. They're not going to show some of the the cool things about Silicon Valley in order to make a point uh, about some of its ridiculousness. But if it's done right, which I trust Mike Judge in these sorts of things, uh, it's it's going to be a great send up and it's going to be intelligent. And and funny so i'm looking forward to it as well yeah absolutely <laughs> let's check in on the final day of the winter movie draft <laughs> brian brushwood with one day left you are four million dollars ahead of scott johnson you are going to win this my friend yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, breaking while we were talking just now on frame rate, the latest numbers for the Monday of January 21st came out, and it looks like uh, Lincoln made uh, $1.3 million on a Monday. Le Mis made uh, $1.7 million on that same Monday. There's no way. There's no way Le Mis is suddenly going to get 10 times more popular in the next 24 hours. So I'm calling it. I'm king of all seasons, the first double winner of the movie draft. Thank you very much. You, my friend, deserve it. Uh, you, 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 your strategy that you've been humping for years now has finally paid off. Uh, going for a wide spectrum over tent poles uh, and and lucking into Lincoln. Frankly, not part of the strategy, but but part of the sort of po you know planning for possibilities. You had lots of different things that could pay off, like Looper, which maybe didn't pay off as much as you would have hoped. Oh, Lincoln sure, sure, sure. Well, yeah. and that, and that's the thing. It's like uh, it's like look, uh, if if your strategy is to buy high risk lottery tickets, yes, you're lucky when one of them pays off huge. But it was your strategy of buying all the high risk lottery tickets that that won it for you. So it's like I'm not going to claim. And man, this thing was freaking close. I'm not going to claim like I knew that uh, that that Lincoln was going to win it for me or that it was going to win all the the Oscars or anything like that. But I knew that that taking the big risks on all those movies increased the chance that there would be a surprise breakout hit on my roster. And uh, uh, L Lincoln was the number one uh, dollar for dollar in the entire draft, which it only crossed over that threshold like two weeks ago. But uh, I could not believe what a nail biter this was right down to the very end, the last day. And we all, and, and by what, $3.5 million. It was amazing. Yeah. By the skin of your spiky hair. Congratulations. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, man. I'm already looking forward to the summer, man. Uh, me too. I, and until then, we we have the interregnum movies, Hansel and Gretel, witch hunters coming out uh, this weekend. <laughs> Oh, January, you truly are the land of a thousand promises of movies that just sort of got shuffled under the rug. Let's talk about what we are watching. Then. What we're watching. Now, I want to start off by telling you a story, Brian. It's a story of the modern age. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have not seen the finale of Fringe yet. Uh, lots of people have been asking me on Twitter about this. It aired on Friday. They want to know my parent, my uh, my my opinion of it. I have not seen that, nor have I seen the premiere of Archer, uh, dude. Which uh, which I, which, I, which premiered this week. I have seen the latest episode of Top Chef. <laughs> I don't even know you anymore, Tom Merritt. Here, 
Here's why, Brian. Go on. Uh, Fringe was set up as a DVR uh, season pass. That's how I was relying on getting it. When we were watching it on Channel 2 in San Francisco, when we moved the DVR to Los Angeles, Fox is no longer on Channel 2. The DVR went, Uh I don't see any Fringe on Channel 2. A bunch of other CBS stuff on there or something. I don't know what that is. So did not record. Uh, Archer, I had caught up on by watching on Netflix and then watching on uh, Amazon and just totally forgot to go set up a season. Oh, right. I have to go do a thing to collect these. I can't just go watch them. Uh, And so I I set it up late and it recorded on Saturday. We had family in town. And so I didn't get a chance to watch it. Same reason I haven't watched Fringe because I did buy it from Apple TV. uh, But we had so much going on over the weekend that I just haven't had a chance since then. I would have been able to watch it Friday night. But why have I watched the latest episode of Top Chef? Not because by even a stretch do I like Top Chef as much as Archer and Fringe? But because I had started the season of that Top Chef as an Apple iTunes subscriber to the show. And it showed up, sent me an email, said the latest episode is here. And I said, well, I got nothing to watch tonight. Click, watched it, done. I'll tell you what, man. It's unbelievable how intolerant we are of taking any extra action. Like, I'm the same way. I loved Archer and I was thrilled for the premiere but it's I just couldn't find it in me to go out to the living room and go through that stupid DVR interface and I have no idea what channel things are on I don't want to have to find I don't have to use up down arrows to scroll through letters to try spell Archer like that's whole five whole stupid minutes so it's like it just doesn't even happen and it's like man now granted we sound like spoiled brats and perhaps we are but There's never been a time in my life that I've been more intolerant of me having to do something to get my media. I now am totally spoiled, and I feel like everything needs to be delivered to me on a platter. I've already told the world that I like it. I've already done things in the past that indicate the shows that I like. Why is the system not providing me with the stuff I like? That's what I want to know, because I'm with you. I did jump in a car, drove to a movie theater. (laughs) <laughs> waited around outside for the for them to open the theater and went inside and watched Django Unchained, which I found quite enjoyable. Thank you very much. I hear great things about Django Unchained. I need to, yeah. I need to see it now that Comic uh, book finally... Western. Awesome. Quentin Tarantino. If you, if you don't like Quentin Tarantino, don't go see it because you're not going to like it. It's Quentin Tarantino through and through, but it's I found it really fun and really enjoyable. It is very, also very violent, but it's Quentin Tarantino. What have you been watching? Uh, I started watching Portlandia on Netflix, mainly because Justin Robert Young recommended it so heartily. Uh, it's it's good, and uh, mainly I'm just excited because there's a lot of them to go through. You ever get with that where it's like you start to nibble on something and you get excited because you know like, oh, this is going to continue to feed me for a long time while I'm doing other stuff. And there's uh, there's some yeah, good you know, sketches Portlandia in there. is an example of that for me, actually, because we watched the first season on Catch Up. Uh, and and plowed through a bunch of episodes. And then once we caught up, we're like, we haven't watched it since. Yeah, well, because you just want that convenience of being able to binge all at once. I'm telling you, this is why this is why I'm convinced Netflix is right with what they're doing with the rest of development. Uh, and then also on the recommendation of a friend on Netflix, I watched the movie Heckler, uh, which was uh, put together by Jamie Kennedy. And it was a really weird experience because I didn't expect to care for any of it. But, like, the first third of that movie is a really good – they get some very high-quality, famous folks talking about the nature of hecklers and why is it uh, in the middle of live performances people want to steal the spotlight and for one shining moment shout something hateful at this person on stage trying to do his his job. And and there's some interesting footage. that They they, they show the footage of Yui Bowl just beating the crap out of critics inside inside the ring. Uh, So it's like the first third is about the nature of hecklers – and then the second section is about, like, uh, our critics, hecklers. And then at that point, that's when it started to lose me because the entire last half of the movie Heckler is Jimmy Kennedy kind of nakedly asking why people are so mean to him. Why don't they like his stuff? And uh, and it's like it really kind of ends on a sad down note. Uh, but uh, and of course, so- Brian, why don't you just leave Jamie Kennedy alone? That's yeah, so there's a bit of you. irony to this. <laughs> so, but definitely watch it, uh, especially for the first half, and then tell me if I'm wrong on the second half. But I found the second half like it got uncomfortable. The the pity party he started to throw for himself, and it's I it, it made me that part made me sad. But the movie is an interesting watch. 
Now, we already uh, did get to Graham's feedback about H Plus and Film Found, but we have another piece of feedback. Now it's time it's for time. feedback with Brian and Tom on Fame Radio. Yeah. Really, really glad you put this one in here, Brian. I love this one. Uh, it's uh, Ian, a.k.a. the Geeky Brit, a.k.a. Chief Librarian, Central Library of Gallifrey, uh, says, Hi, guys. Just wanted to share a thought. Is it normal for a geek to be angry when something they love becomes popular? I have loved and enjoyed Doctor Who for over 40 years, and now everybody is jumping on the bandwagon now that bow ties are cool. You can even go into Walmart and buy a T-shirt stating just that. Bow ties are cool. Doctor Who is my show, so leave it alone. Just because you know what a Suntaran is doesn't make you a fan. When you can tell me the nickname that the third doctor gave his car, then you can claim to be a fan. Okay, I am done venting now. Thanks for listening. I'm going back into my basement and enjoy my collection of Blake 7. Next thing you know, they'll be remaking that great show as well. Keep up the great work. This is awesome because it solves the age-old question of can hardcore geeks be hipsters? And the answer is clearly yes. Because they're because look, man, that's that's the weird thing about being a consumer is you feel an ownership of curation. You invest yourself emotionally, and when you share it with somebody else, like that's the way I felt about the the Dark Tower. Like like if you heard the early beta episodes of Frame Rape, when I'm talking to Tom Merritt and say, no, you don't understand. This is such this is the most amazing epic fantasy western sci-fi story in the world it's what it's most underappreciated of all of king's work or whatever and it made me super nervous to see the the reports of a ron howard movie and of a television show with a computer generated oil of midworld and so on like I, i'm terrified because you don't want to spend a decade of your life investing in something and then have it slip away from you and become something that means something totally different to other people and causes them to judge you. I experienced it like I remember watching Mr. Show with Bob and David and Tenacious D's early shorts on HBO. And then they became something that frat boys would sing as thinly veiled misogyny. And it's uh, it you feel like you've lost something. And that's part of the rage I feel for Star Wars of what George Lucas has done to the brand because it meant something dirty and gritty and powerful to me. And now it's just silly. Everything's silly and poop jokes. And it's just, a uh, yeah, man, it's okay to feel like you had something taken away from you by the popularity of it. But at least it's still good. It's, at least they didn't drive it into the ground and make it a yeah. laughing stock. It's perfectly normal to feel that way. Uh, however... There is another element to this. Brian, you you noted some of the causes and some of the reasons for this. Especially the Star Wars one is different than what I'm about to say. Uh, but there's also an element to loving something unpopular that makes you feel like you know something. And you get pleasure out of knowing something that other people don't. That's true of facts, right? That's oh, why absolutely. no one like to know it all because they're always rubbing it in your face how they know something. So when you love something that is not popular and you think it's amazing, you feel a little superiority and you get the kick out of introducing it to people you value. You, you want have your a secret friends, is what it you is. want your loved ones to join you in this. Hey, hey, check this out. Let me let me do you the favor of introducing you to this thing I love that not many other people know about. And when it becomes popular, it robs you of that because all of a sudden there's these people that you don't even know who already love the thing you love and you didn't get anything out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you had a secret and it was uh, it was great material that you could share. It's almost like a type of drug. Like I'm going to give you an experience that you've never had before and you will share something precious with me. And uh, and you can't do that. It's it's been this thing that this material that you've had suddenly becomes devalued. And I can I can understand that because it's cheap. It's everyone sees it. It's like, oh, yeah, Dr. Who, that's the thing that my uh, my eight year old likes. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really into kids programming. And then right. it's just like, and you feel like, what? And, so sure. And, and frankly, Ian, while, yes, that's perfectly normal to feel that way, you should not let yourself run away with it. And it doesn't mean, as Brian already said, that the thing itself has been devalued. There may be cases in which it has been devalued because the creators let the popularity change the way they created it. Uh, but but it doesn't necessarily have to happen. In fact, a lot of times popularity gives people more resources and they can do things better. So it, I think on the whole, it's better when things become popular. And I don't hate, I try not to hate them just because they're popular. 
Yeah. Because I Tried think that's to. reverse. That's reverse discrimination. That's like, uh, oh, yeah. whether it's good or not, I'm I'm gonna hate it to be cool, and that's just as bad. I think the operative word is try because try as I might, there are things that become popular, and I just maybe I don't maybe I don't decide I hate it all of a sudden, but I certainly emotionally divorce myself because I can't handle continuing to love it and have it be something that means something different to so many people. I propose an experiment, Brian. What? We're gonna need we're gonna need the audience's help with this. Uh, let's make frame rate insanely popular and see if That's we great. still love doing it. That's great, and then we'll get uh, we'll get gold plated beards, and then see if it really changes us right, or not. Right. And we'll That's see if, the only way. You, you guys, the early adopters who love it now, we'll see how you feel. I want you to report your feelings as the show becomes popular, but but we will uh, need however, to go and tell everyone you know to subscribe right. and start downloading frame rate. And, and understand, once we get to this level of popularity, we won't have time to read all the emails. So if you would just jot down your feelings on the back of $100 bills and just hand them to us, much bigger chance that we'll actually read it. It's going to yeah. be a different world, but There's I think it, we'll be doing a lot for science if we could yeah. just do this. It's for science, so do it. <laughs> Uh, you can email us what you think of that idea, framerateintwit.tv. Uh, and if you are telling all your friends, tell them to go to twit.tv slash FR. That's where you can find us on the web. And, of course, we're live on Mondays at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll see you next time. Bye. Awesome. You know, what's funny is we were having that, as I was reading that email, uh, I wish you could hear it. I wish the Heil mic wasn't so darn good. Uh, but from upstairs, I hear, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs>